The Wonderful World of Dark Lords Report 17 The McElminster House I took a moment to get my bearings and explore the flooded, ransacked manor house. The last time I became lost in the mists, it took me to King Haggard's land, a domain that was still of interest to my patron. Perhaps the same would be true here, and if so, the burglary of the house might contain clues. This hope seemed at first to be unfounded. The house no longer contained much of anything, as the bandits had been thorough. However, a quick search of the kitchens revealed more antitoxins than I was accustomed to seeing, and the armoires and dressers contained a tremendous variety of gloves. I was not in some mysterious domain that I had yet to explore. I was in Borka. It was only a matter of time before someone caught me and accused me of the crime. I slipped out of the servant's entrance and emerged on the outskirts of Sturban. Well, I had intended to return home to resupply. I may as well do so here. As I journeyed toward town, however, I caught sight of another house, one that was closer to the main thoroughfare than many of the surrounding mansions. It was a massive edifice of brick, lined with airy windows. Nothing about it was any grander or more mysterious than the other opulent homes for Borka's decadent elite, but gazing at it, I became certain that it was special. With eldritch sight, I could see that it was bursting with arcane energy. This house was a magical treasure trove. I was certain that whatever my patron sought, it was inside. More than that, I would know it the moment I saw it, and I would no longer have to wonder why I had been sent on this errand. My ring of protection went cold on my finger, and this mad conviction left me as suddenly as it had come. I appraised the house with new eyes. I had accepted it immediately as part of the landscape, but... It was obvious now that the architecture was not Borken, nor was it old enough to be this thoroughly established in the heart of town. Perhaps it was some kind of cursed or haunted building, or perhaps I had found another pocket domain. Regardless, I could not leave Sturban until I had investigated it more thoroughly. Welcome to Wonderful World of Dark Lords. I'm Tom. I'm Rachel. And we're discussing how to convert Disney movies to Ravenloft Domains of Dread, and because Disney has bought almost everything, we can cast quite a wide net. Along the way, we'll look at the Dark Lord, the domain itself, and some plot hooks and adaptation ideas to integrate the setting into your own campaign. Today's episode, Home Alone. But Home Alone, Home Alone. is not animated. And <laughs> yeah, or by Disney. <laughs> Originally, Originally, but now it yeah, is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As mentioned. First off, okay, number one, yes, Home Alone. Yes. That's happening. That's yes. not a joke. Not an April Fool's episode. This isn't a car situation. Mm -hmm. This is, we are doing for our December episode, Home Alone. Mm -hmm. And it, while not animated, it does fall under that category of it was uh, distributed by Fox, owned by Fox, they were bought by Disney, so thanks to Disney's octopus <laughs> my bacteria like absorption of everything around it, we have a very wide net of possibilities. And yes, it's not animated, but it's the holiday season. It's a time of miracles and magic and things being abnormal. We're going to do Hocus Pocus for a Halloween episode, even though it's live action. We can do Home Alone for a Christmas episode uh -huh. because it's live action. And Honestly, where a lot of this came from, because we were yes. originally going to do this as a bonus episode. Yes. Be for all the reasons mentioned. We just laid out. Yeah, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't originally Disney. Mm -hmm. It is live action. Mm -hmm. Like... Normally, our non-Disney time is April, and uh -huh. we cannot do this as an April episode. It's got to be a Christmas yes, episode. Yes, yes, yes. Come on. So we were originally going to do this as a bonus episode, kind of almost more of as a joke than right. anything else. Right, kind of a Cars type thing. Yeah. But as we were playing it out, we were like, holy potatoes, this is not a joke. Mm -hmm. Kevin is a dark lord. Kevin is a dark lord. <laughs> And his house is a great dungeon. Yes, so. it is. Great Dark Lord plus Great Dungeon equals Great Domain for us to do. And perfectly themed for this, our December episode. So mm -hmm. how could we resist? This might not be our last December episode that was originally Fox. If we, mm -hmm. You know, which once upon some other December, we may do another yep, one. Let's yep, yep. Wait, we got some thoughts. We got some thoughts. <laughs> So we have, I think, obvious to you, if you've seen this movie even once, is our conceit that the house is a great dungeon. Mm -hmm. And our second point that brought us to this is that conceit that Kevin is a great Dark Lord. So let's talk about what makes him a great Dark Lord and indeed what a Dark Lord is and what would make anyone a great Dark Lord <laughs> in a section we like to call The Lord. The Lord. When I inquired about the manor, the people of Sturban were eager to tell tales about the old McElminster place. 
Some said that it was abandoned and haunted, citing the sounds of music and the strange dancing silhouettes that occasionally appeared in the windows. Others swore that it was still occupied by a mad and mercurial wizard. Many of these had a cousin or old friend or former maidservant who had made a delivery to the McElminster place, only to be taunted and tormented by its owner. Sometimes with frightening illusions, other times with vicious traps. Only the rare, generous payouts from the wizard can induce couriers to return, although, in truth, his tips are more often miserly. Solid facts about this mysterious wizard are difficult to come by, as he is a hermit who has never once been seen outside the house. I was able to steal a journal from the house confirming that his name is Kevin, and that he is the last remaining member of a powerful wizarding family. As my patron will later see, I have my suspicions about what happened to the other McElminsters. My own research confirmed that, while everyone swore the house had been there for as long as they could remember, its provenance was elusive. A trip to the records office showed that not only had no one named McElminster ever lived in Sturban, but the land on which the house sat actually belonged to the Ocretier family. If Sunnyside was any indication, I suspected that the McElminster house would vanish in a few days. The people of Sturban would relegate it to rumor and legend, while the people of another town found themselves swearing that the Mad Wizard's manor had always been among them. So, our Dark Lord of this setting is Kevin McAllister, or as he's going to be known in our write-up, <laughs> which is a particularly copyright-skirting one. There's no, like, pre-existing folkloric mm -hmm. or mythological or literary public domain we tradition to fall on here. We don't even have the Santa Cecilia of, like, what? She's the patron saint of music. Hey, there, there probably are villages yeah. in Mexico called Santa Cecilia. <laughs> if you Google it, we, we just assumed. So, in this here podcast situation, we can call him Kevin McAllister in the write-up, which we're going to put in the style of Edmonton's Guide to Ravenloft, domain write-up on DMs Guild for free. He will be Kevin McElminster, which... <laughs> I'm pretty proud of. As you should be. Right. So it's the old McElminster house. <laughs> That's our, our sort of literary domain in the in the written tradition versus the oral tradition. Mm -hmm, and we have mm -hmm. a, a branching here, whether it's the McAllister house or the McElminster house. There are two sources. Yes, right. P and D. <laughs> and they, uh... So we've mentioned that our Dark Lord is Kevin McAllister for our purposes here. And so you know who Kevin McAllister is, because I don't know if there's anyone in America that doesn't. Uh, ah! Yeah, right? Especially if you were a hashtag 90s kid. Mm -hmm. That was inescapable. Mm -hmm. But you might not know what a Dark Lord is. So, Rachel, what is a Dark Lord? Well, a Dark Lord is an evil being who commits some kind of act of ultimate darkness, and the dark powers take a look at them and say, wait, well, hello, new friend, we want to play with you forever. And so they pluck them up and they place them in a domain, which is a special hell tailor-made just for them. Mm -hmm. There are great Dark Lords... There are Inza Kolvoviches. Ooh, I haven't mentioned her whoa, whoa. before. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even know what we're talking about. She was the one... This could be made up. Speaking of skirting copyright, she was the one who replaced Soth as Dark Lord of Sivikis. Oh, wow, yeah, that lady. When 3rd Edition was no longer had a thing with Wizards of the Coast. And so if you want to know who we're thinking of every time we say not evil for the sake of being evil, <laughs> it's this one. Her curse is that somewhere there are people that aren't evil. And yes. And that makes her mad. Uh, how how <laughs> commander as how skeletor of her so but there are many dark lords who are not in Zakolvich. most of them thankfully <laughs> so we are going to look at those qualities that separate the straws from the inzas and we have four that we've come up with the first is that they have some kind of active ultimate darkness there was one specific thing they did that really got the dark powers attention mm -hmm. and in Strahd's case it was that he killed his brother because he wanted to go with his brother's fiance the second is what they call in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft the torment because we're a Disney podcast we call it they got what they wanted they lost what they had and in Strahd's case it's that you know congratulations you have eternal youth so you're not too old for Tityana anymore wait a minute Tityana who again mm -hmm. that, that lady ah. who like <laughs> fell off a cliff after you killed your brother our third is that there's some kind of element of tragedy or relatability. They're not just evil for the sake of being evil. Unlike like in the cold in the <laughs> There's something about them that makes us say, yeah, that's, that's rough, buddy. And in Strahd's case, it's that unrequited love and having the girl you're into jump off a cliff to get away from Yeah, that is the worst. Pretty, pretty rough stuff. Yeah, yeah. 
And then our final element is that the domain reflects the Dark Lord and their curse in some way. Um, Strahd is the Dark Lord of Barovia. He is not the Dark mm -hmm. Lord of Sethicus. And Barovia is this boring mud slump where he doesn't really have an intellectual equal and he's lonely. And that's reflecting the broader curse of his loneliness of that he can never be with Tityana. And also he has, you know, killed his brother who was kind of his peer and his equal. And so congratulations, you're lonely forever, pal. So our premise, our opening kind of bit was we were watching Home Alone, as many people do in the holiday season or outside of the holiday season if they have a child that's obsessed with it. Oh my gosh, our youngest was so into Home Alone. And... Like, normally we have to, like, sit down and do the rewatch mm -hmm. as we're, like, podcast prepping, big our official podcast prep rewatch. But this was, like, there was a good two weeks where Home Alone was just, like, cycling continuously on the TV. And we're yeah. like, you know what? We're okay. We're yeah. good. Like, <laughs> over the course of... of the last two weeks we've each seen the full movie three or four times yeah. so we're, we're okay for that and so we were watching it and we're saying holy potatoes kevin is a dark lord and it's because kevin in the movie nothing like no weird crazy stuff that we're bringing in but just even going by the movie we hit all four of those things mm -hmm. so we'll start with the act of ultimate darkness this is not murdering the burglars with <laughs> Skull injuries to the skull. This is not manslaughter. Mm -hmm. This is him making his family disappear. And, of course, we know in the context of the movie, it, he didn't really do this, but he believed that he did. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to, right? Like, his wish was that his family would disappear. So, of course, it's being Dungeons & Dragons, being a world of fantasy, a world of magic, a world of horror. We can say he did. Yeah. So to get into the backstory, we're coming up with a little bit that his father was a wealthy spellcaster. He, the extended family, was getting together at their house, their, their very, very large house, <laughs> on the outskirts of some village. And they were planning, not going to getting together, and they were planning they were going to go into this teleportation circle to travel to visit some relatives for the winter solstice, the Yule holiday. Uh, there's very high tension with the family. Some things happen that make them sort of blame it on Kevin. Everyone kind of like takes out their anger on Kevin. And that bickering is continuing as they're like, the father's getting ready to cast the teleportation spell. Something happened. Kevin lashes out, shoving Buzz. We're taking a bit from Home Alone 2 here. <laughs> and he, he shoves Buzz, knocks him into their father, at that very moment, he was, like, doing the wishing his family disappeared. Wishing they did. That's kind of where we get the I wish you were all gone kind of moment mm -hmm. that we have a little earlier in the movie. And they do. They disappear. The teleportation spell goes wrong. They disappear. They don't ever arrive at their destination. They're just sort of lost in the ether, the ether of magic. Kevin has some, like, latent spellcasting abilities, sure. and by making this powerful wish, and he's, he, like, channels these energies, and it's his will that takes over instead of his mm. father's, or something, something, something. Right, right, right. You know, you, you mess around, you you have, you try and spellcast with a bunch of bickering children around, so he's <laughs> probably gonna go wrong. <laughs> and he was happy. So, in, in both our magic literal version, and the sort of symbolic psychological in the movie, it's that kind of that joy at finding they have disappeared. That's our act of ultimate darkness. Yeah. And our torment, so that brings us to our torment, which once again, we see over the course of the yes. movie. That adds, it's really good. It's, it's so it's, silly. It's such a good movie. It's Home Alone, it's but it's a great alone, movie, but... and it's a great Dark Lord movie. <laughs> <laughs> so silly to say this, but it's true. Mm -hmm. And so he is alone, and at first, he's happy, but not really. No, he's lonely. He misses them. Once again, you could, you could look at the movie. You could look at kind of after that first fun montage of him enjoying being home alone, that like first day, basically. Mm -hmm. When he's watching the movie, he gets scared. He, he cries for his mother and she's not there. And he, the next day, they're still gone. He had, that was a, that was a fun day having the house to yourself, but they're still gone. It's like sinking in. They might really be gone. Mm -hmm. And he got what he wanted and he lost what he had. Yeah. And that's a torment, baby. It sure is. But this being Ravenloft and this being a Dark Lord, our fictional Kevin slash Kevin cannot have the kind of personal growth and realization of the movie Kevin. Because that that's sort of the whole point of being a Dark Lord is you don't have personal growth mm -hmm. or realizations. So, yeah, we don't, we don't have him going and asking Santa, the guy who works for Santa. Yes. I'm sorry. 
to uh, to ask the real Sansa to bring his family back. Right. We don't have him even wishing for it or mm-hmm. being the, you know, oh, where are you? Yeah, sitting in his parents' bed looking at the picture and yeah. saying he didn't mean it. We're sort of in that, that first day where he's having fun. As a dark lord, he's kind of locked into that, that he is pretending he's still happy. He is pretending he doesn't miss them, but he does. He's lonely. He misses his family. He's incredibly guilty. He's kind of eaten up by guilt. But he's got that classic kind of Dark Lord double down. (laughs) The classic Dark Lord double down of, no, you know what? It's their fault. I'm happy they're gone. Darn it. No matter how much I cry when I think about how lonely I am. (laughs) Those are are tears of joy. I'm so happy I'm alone. I'm not sorry. I'll never be sorry. I'm not sorry and I'll never be sorry. And we even have the part of that torment is he gets flashes of his family, especially his mother. Right? That's the one he was closest to. It's the one he had the most immediate blowout fight with before this. And he gets flashes of his mother. This is kind of our version of those, like, moments of almost, like, psychic or spiritual connection between him and his mother that we have over the course of the movie. Mm-hmm. And so he, he gets flashes of them in the house. They were kind of, you know, in the ethereal plane after the teleportation gone wrong. They occasionally bleed over. But that just sort of pushes him to Dark Lord Double Down, raise the trademark, that, (laughs) no, you know what, I'm glad you're gone. I'm not sorry. And so he's sublimating this a lot into a paranoia about the house. That Mm -hmm. kind of, he's sublimating a lot of his guilt over what he, what he, not if he believes he's done, but no, he actually did in our version. Yeah, in our version. A lot of his guilt, a lot of his loneliness, a lot of his sorrow. He's sublimating it into this intense paranoia about the house, that he's paranoid about invaders, attackers. He never leaves it because he's so afraid. He's constantly building new traps and, you know, incredibly paranoid about uh, someone trying to steal things or break in or hurt him in some way. Because ultimately, under all this, like, even though he's got, you know, a bunch of powerful magic stuff in the house that his father left behind, he is a small child whose family is gone. Uh And there are a lot of much bigger people out yeah, there, and yeah. he's terrified of them. Like, he, he doesn't is... have his parents to protect him anymore. As he's going into full survivalist, I have to take care of myself. Mm-hmm. So now he has this great house. He has it all to himself. He has exactly what he wanted, but that's a prison. He's mm-hmm. trapped in a prison of his own creation, which really, is there a better way to describe a dark lord? No. And you could even bring in the soap. Because, okay. All right. I need, to, I need to get in my Home Alone soapbox here. Okay. Okay. All right. Because there are people who are all like, clearly Kevin is just a sadist for going after Harry and Marv because he could have called the police at any time. He just wanted to watch them hurt. And there's an element of truth to that. Yeah, especially in this version. Especially in this version. But in the movie, there was the bit where he accidentally stole the toothbrush. And they called the police and the police were chasing after him. So he thinks if he calls the police, they're going to arrest him for yeah, stealing yeah. a toothbrush. So that's, that is why he does not call the police and why he goes after Harry and Marv. But you could work out something similar to that where, like, he's convinced that if he leaves the house, something terrible is going to happen to him, too. Yes, yes, yes. It's like, you know, it's going to get a little soapboxy. Like, it's not clever or smart to point out that it's incredibly improbable mm-hmm. that he'd be left home alone. Because the movie acknowledges it, and, like, the movie very carefully builds in all the, like, million little coins, things that go wrong for him to be left home alone. Yeah. It doesn't just have, like, you know, the the movie checks off every box. Mm -hmm. And it's similarly, why doesn't he call the police? No, there's an answer. The movie does build in a scene explaining it. They they, they anticipated that, that point and built in a scene explaining it. It just doesn't make for good clickbaity YouTube videos. Yeah, yeah. So he's paranoid about leaving the house. He's paranoid about other people coming to the house. He's just alone. Home alone. Home alone with his thoughts, as all Dark Lords ultimately are. So that brings us to our element of tragedy and relatability. And once again, I don't think I need to sell this. That part of the reason the movie works is because of Kevin's relatability. Mm -hmm. Like the movie, like it's such a good, you know, that tightrope of on the one hand, he's kind of obnoxious. On the other hand, and it's really kind of a, a mean and obnoxious thing to be saying what he's saying to his mother. On the other hand, we all can empathize with where he's coming from. We can all, you know, have been in a packed house at a holiday occasion. Mm-hmm. 
And when tensions are running high and everybody's stressed, we've all had those moments that just, that just the, everything went wrong. Much like with him being left home alone, just sort of everything went wrong to bring out his worst self that mm-hmm. day. And we've all been there and we've all had days where like everything is going wrong and we just wish our family were gone and we just wish we were alone. We all have that feeling of being like the youngest in the family, the one that everyone's ignoring, everyone's picking on, uh, the one that's just being overlooked or blamed for everything that goes wrong. And we can all enjoy the power fantasy. Mm -hmm. We can all enjoy that. We will remember being kids. If you're not a kid listening to this right now, in which case, hello. Uh, We, but, but even those of us who've grown up, and you might not believe this, children I just greeted, (laughs) <laughs> Those of us who are grown up can remember being a kid and can remember like that sort of power fantasy of, yeah. you know what? It would be amazing to have the house for yourself, to be able to eat ice cream and watch R-rated movies <laughs> and jump on your parents' bed and go sledding down the stairs. And <laughs> just, it, it, it's that core wish fulfillment power fantasy that you get as an element of a lot of almost apocalyptic stuff of the, mm-hmm. but you know what? There wouldn't be any rules. <laughs> I could do whatever. Yes, there'd be zombies everywhere, but I could do whatever I wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, I could take whatever I wanted from the stores and I could, you know, ride a tank down Fifth Avenue and <laughs> I could just, I could do anything I wanted. And that's part of why, as I said, the movie is so successful is because Kevin is such a relatable character and that makes him, more, even this sort of darker version of Kevin, I think preserves a bit of that core relatability. Dear listeners, how many of you of a certain age ever got really annoyed with your siblings and said, I wish the goblins would come and take you mm-hmm. away right now. <laughs> and really, truly meant it. Yes, yes, yes. And not just because that might mean you got to dance with David Bowie. You were, you were too young to understand why you wanted that at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but not too young to understand. You just wished your stupid baby or whatever sibling would be gone. <laughs> so then finally, the domain reflects the Dark Lord personality, the Dark Lord curse. The domain reflects the Dark Lord in general. The domain we're imagining is just a house in the grounds, right? Like this this is one of our smaller domains. Uh, this is not like a village or a town or a country. This is like a house in the grounds because once again, that's his whole world. Mm-hmm. Like his whole world is this house. He, it manifests, we're imagining it, that the house manifest kind of house of lament style in many other domains it's it can show up it can kind of float through other domains it's got this weird it might be kind of a weird nexus where many domains people will have heard of the old mickelminster house and there will be on that isolated hill and everyone thinks it's haunted and it's all strange and creepy and abandoned and part of what we're imagining is that the house has a kind of part of that torment is the house draws people. Mm-hmm. It may, we'll get this more a little bit in the uh, domain section, but it, it draws people. Like Kevin can't be left alone. That's sort of one of the ways the domain manifests the torment is he wants theoretically to be alone, but he can't be left alone. He can't enjoy the sort of solitude and peace because people are always coming. He's always triggering his paranoia and his fear. So he's always kind of living that base child wishing your parent even if you're not gonna like apologize for anything you wish they were back to, mm-hmm. to protect you yeah like that's go- that's not there we also are imagining that this house also has a tendency to draw their lost souls this is sort of our version of how in home alone one we have the old man and home alone two we have the pigeon lady <laughs> and it's because home alone two is a just Beat by oh, beat. Good lord, uh, that movie. If you have not, if like us, you had not seen it since going to see it in movie theaters in 1995 or 6 or whatever. Tim Curry is the only good thing yeah, about yeah. that movie. It's not good. It's such a just, it's yeah. beat for beat, character for character, moment for moment. But worse. It is just a Xerox with all the charm gone. Mm-hmm. Because part of, as we mentioned, the original was such a delicate balancing act of yeah. like things like tone. And this absolute, like Kevin is just a little brat in, in Home Alone 2. Yeah. I don't have palm trees. I don't have Christmas trees. Mm-hmm. Go to hell. <laughs> and we're not talking about Home Alone 2. Uh, I'm going to write about it. But anyway, so we have these two very parallel characters in Home Alone 2. And in both and cases... Home Alone and Home Alone 1. And in both cases, they are um, kind of lost souls. They're kind of people that have that same alienation, that same sort of fear, that same separation... As Kevin does, and in one, it's because it's a, a really cool, powerful, thematic parallel, and in two, it's because it's a knockoff of one, <laughs> but either way, put them together, and we have this sense of the the house draws these kind of lost souls, especially people that feel very alienated and betrayed by their loved ones, 
And so that's another thing we kind of have on the grounds of the house. We It's not actually just Kevin. We have a couple other people sort of drawn into its orbit that are part of it now. Yeah. And whenever the house manifests, like, you know, let's say it manifests in Valakai, Valaki. I don't know how you say it. Yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, whatever. Uh, so let's say, let's say it were to manifest just outside of Valakai. And then, you know, the, the old man and the pigeon lady, they would be there. But then they would kind of, like, wander out in Valaki, Valakai mm-hmm. place. Mm-hmm. They, they, you know, they wouldn't just be hanging around. Right, Kevin's yeah. backyard the whole time. But then whenever it packs up and leaves, they always find their way back. There uh-huh. Again. So, yeah, yeah. And that might even be a fun, like, all of these different towns have the legend of the Shuffle Slayer. Mm-hmm, yeah. She's like this boogeyman or the everywhere. Lady, or yeah. the Pigeon Lady, yeah. Oh, I love that. That's good. <laughs> Then, oh man, that's a great like plot thread. Your players mm-hmm. hear about the shovel slayer, and then it's like, oh wow, weird. It's like the third time we've been to that we've heard about the shovel slayer. That's the plot, and they follow it. It's like, oh, it's home alone! Oh my god. <laughs> So, fundamentally, the house is his fortress, the house is his prison, the house is the reflection of that inner self, and that is why I think we can say all of our hallmarks are present in Kevin, even in the movie, just in our version even more so. Mm-hmm. So, as a Dark Lord, which we've well established he is, <laughs> he has certain powers and abilities, and let's talk about how we kind of wanted to do that, because... Unlike many Disney movies, this is not someone who turns into a dragon or yeah. has sorcery or the powers of the occult or commands a legion of followers or whatever. This is a mischievous boy with a glue gun. <laughs> and for the basic stat block, he has stats similar to a scout because that gives us ranged attack for the BB gun. That gives us some survival, some profession, some stealth. We are saying that he has proficient in all tools because mm-hmm. that is he is this incredibly handy, incredibly crafty, building all this stuff. He has a wand of magic missiles because that's uh-huh. our version of a BB gun. Yep. <laughs> and he has all of these magical resources he has access to, which we said his father was kind of a spellcaster. And most of the things replenish themselves. Like all the supplies. He's not like starving. He's not eating shoe leather or anything. Sometimes he'll full on get things delivered, which we'll talk about in a minute. But, you know, his father made things that magically replenish themselves and also part of sort of the the dark powers, part of the sort of curse magic of the curse is he always has the supplies he needs. And his father does have some, has made some automatons, but he's repurposed them into security. So he does have to do a lot of housework. This is kind of, you know, we see the doing the laundry and doing the shopping. And this is sort of how he keeps busy. And this is how even in the movie, he's kind of sublimating some of the feelings he's, he's having and trying to sort of be a better person as this kind of taking responsibility and caring for the house. And... So we also have that his father had some money and that money does keep replenishing. So what he doesn't have in the house, he can get delivered. And once again, just sort of part of the curse, he has the ability to like send money and orders to stores in whatever domain, whatever city he pops up in. Mm -hmm. Just like he's just sort of there that they don't find this weird or confusing. It seems perfectly natural for them to get a pizza delivery call from this house. (laughs) From Little Nero's Pizza. (laughs) But the main power that he has that your PCs are going to be interacting with are his wall-to-wall lair actions. Wall-to-wall. Just everything that he has is based around these traps that he's setting Mm -hmm. up in his house. Which are limited only by your imagination. Yes. Dear. Uh, we will talk about traps more in a minute, and there will be some suggested ones in the DM's Gold domain right now. Yes, but that that is absolutely his number one power, is all of these traps he has set up in the house. And speaking of the house, we had mentioned before that he never gets to be left alone. He, the people are always coming after him, because when people look at his house, they see it's the silver the tuna. The silver tuna. That's why we started working this street. <laughs> you're just you're convinced when you see the house if there's something you're looking for you are irrationally convinced that it's in that house like nothing will persuade you that the yes, house doesn't yes. have the MacGuffin or that that house doesn't just have so much more money than any right. other house like can whatever higher after yes. this job whatever your sort of heart's desire is you are strongly convinced is in that house and that means that's as Rachel said part of our torment. There'll always be Harry and Marv's. Just mm-hmm. every couple of days, there's some Harry and Marv's coming after, <laughs> especially with people with low wisdom like Harry and yeah, some yeah. low wisdom, low rent thugs. Mm-hmm. Just everywhere he goes, 
he's cycling through Harry and Marsh. Yeah, we can we can make it like a pretty low wisdom save DC, so mm-hmm. you don't have to worry about your entire party of PCs right, right, getting right, right, hit right. by it. Like you, you might have one PC, and everyone's like, "Dude, no, no, like clearly, clearly we're not going to find Aslan's true name." In that <laughs> what like, are you talking about? His phylactery. Yeah. <laughs> that, why would that be there? <laughs> But if it's a whole bunch of Harry and Mars who yep. all have low wisdom saves, then they're just, they're in trouble. And then speaking of wisdom saves, another power that he has is that, you know, when he taunts him and he's all you guys give up, are you thirsty for more? They should give up. You they know, should just leave. Just, D&D rules actually explain a lot of yes, that sequence yes. better than mm-hmm. reality rules. Like, after the third or fourth third degree burn, mm-hmm. like, just go, leave, just leave this kid. You robbed a bunch of houses. I post this on all of my social media every year because it always continues to be true, but Uh Home Alone is the perfect cinematic portrayal of the hit point system. Yes, it is. Because Harry and Marv are totally fine (laughs) taking all this damage. Blow torches and paint cans Mm -hmm. and swinging into walls and irons falling on your head. But then Marley hits them in the face with a shovel and that takes them below zero hit points and they're out. Surprise round, two attacks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Melee attack. They have like one, two hit points left. Boom, boom, dropped. (laughs) Hit points. Yes. But anyway... Going back to to Kevin's taunt powers here. So they should cut their losses and leave. But number one, they're thinking like PCs. PCs Mm -hmm. would never do that. And number two, Kevin has his taunt power that if he's taunted you enough, you make a wisdom save. And if you fail, then all of your other saves until you leave the house or get a long rest are at disadvantage. Yes. So that includes, number one, all of your deck saves. Yeah. And not the tripping on micro machines. Uh huh. And number two, all your further wisdom saves to be like, wait a minute, the sun cost fallacy is a hell of a drug. Wait, like, why am I doing this? <laughs> I, my head is no hair, and now I have a permanent M burned in. I have been branded with an M. I should just go. What does this kid have? DV- a DVD player? When we were trying to figure out in our last episode what would be the Napoleon of crime, you know, what, 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 what's, what's the Napoleon equivalent for, uh, for Radigan? We are having trouble coming up with anything. But Tom realized that Harry is the Vlad Dragov of crime. <laughs> the Vlad Dragov of crime. <laughs> also, to wave after wave of my own men until I've achieved nothing. <laughs> Like no, we're gonna this, this we're gonna get this we're gonna burgle this house if it kills us. Kevin being Azalin in this yes, right. <laughs> in this That's analogy. a good summary of their relationship. Yeah. Get on it, meme makers. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Azalin. This is our gift. Yep, to you. you you are Kevin to Vlad Drakov's Harry and Marv. <laughs> and then finally the power that all Dark Lords have, except Prince John, closing the borders. Yeah, and well, this is not one where we see it in the movie, but we figure with the Christmas theme, we're going to do a snowstorm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically what we did with Arendelle, that there's a snowstorm, mm-hmm. and you're wandering around lost in the snowstorm, and you get turned around, and you come back to the house. Yeah. And, like, this is, number one, we love a good thematic, borders closing. And, uh, number two, this is, like, it fits because the snowstorm is a big, like, plot element. Like, mm-hmm. it's not that anyone is technically snowed in, but it's what cuts the power, it's what cuts the phone lines. It's what sort of like messes everything up. And there is that sense of the storm is connected with his sort of evil Christmas wish. Yeah. And one thing, when he closes the borders, he can stop you from getting out, but he can't stop you from getting Ooh, in. Ooh, yeah. Because that's part of his torment. If he, it, he, otherwise, he just closed the borders all the time. Yep. But he can. So much like Prince John, the border closing is not complete because it is a perfect reflection of his inner torment. Indeed. Only even flippity Kevin from Home Alone is not as much of a putz <laughs> as Prince John. You have been defeated, Prince John. You have been defeated by an eight-year-old child. <laughs> possibly like Vlad Dracoff. Yes, possibly like Ra- looks like Harry or Marv or Vlad Dracoff. <laughs> I mean, he would go through that house. And he he would be absolutely like, would go through that house. And paint cans rest. on the head yes. and like. <laughs> That's why he makes everybody get the hawk brand on their foreheads. <laughs> he got so one. They've yeah. all got big red marks on their heads. <laughs> there was a, it was a hawk a comp- iron company and had the logo and it landed on his head. And left a big eye, a hawk imprint on his forehead. <laughs> no, it's a choice. It's a fashion statement. 
So, we mentioned we're going to be doing this uh, right up on DM's Guild and the model of the Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft domain write-ups. And part of what they do in the Dark Lord section is they have the role-playing trade Ideal Bond and Flaw. And they always do these as quotes. And so, as much as possible, we like to find quotes from the movies that reflect our idea of those things for our Dark Lords. So, quotes that would reflect... Kevin's role-playing trade, ideal bond and flaw. And uh, I was a bit busy this getting the prep for this, so Rachel has prepared some, and we're going to talk them over and decide what we think are good reflections of Kevin's role-playing trade, ideal bond and flaw. Yeah, this was a tricky one because a lot of his stuff is like in dialogue with other people, and also we had I had to kind of be going a lot of it for before he gets his character growth. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. There was Once a. Unlike a Dark Lord, mm -hmm. Kevin pretty quickly realizes his mistake and tries to grow as a person. Yeah. But these are the ones that I collected. Mm -hmm. This house is so full of people, it makes me sick. When I grow up and get married, I'm living alone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want another family. I don't want any family. Families suck. That feels very ideal to me. It does, yes. That's kind of, that is sort of the value statement guiding his decision. Mm -hmm. Is... is I don't want any family. Family suck. Yeah. I don't want to see you again for the rest of my whole life. And I don't want to see anybody else either. Ooh, maybe that's an idea. I don't know. That, that feels kind of like a flaw to me. Yeah, yeah. Like, Ooh, we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll see. We'll see how that it goes. That could be something, yeah. yeah. I made my family disappear. Mm-hmm. I'm reading through all your private stuff. You better come out and pound me. <laughs> that's a good movie. <laughs> that's a good movie. I, I, I have a very strong feeling about how far this one will go. Okay. This is my house. I have to defend it. What? <laughs> what could it be? The external thing that's most important to him? Yeah. The, yeah, okay. Yeah, let, me, let me type that mm -hmm. now in the script. Tippity type, type, clickety click, click. My house going to defend it. You guys give up or are you thirsty for more? <laughs> I, role playing trait. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was gonna it was gonna be either that or I'm reading through all your private stuff. You better come out and help mm. me for the role playing trade. But, but like, yeah, that's like... gonna be how the I hate that the role playing trait and the power are gonna like have similar names. But like that's the role playing trait. That is how the PCs are gonna interact with you. Yes. That is yes. how you, the GM, role play Kevin interacting with the NPCs. Mm -hmm. So. And then the one the the one that I got from Home Alone too. Uh huh. Was don't you know a kid always wins against two idiots. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> okay, so we've got a very... I think we've got a really strong role-playing trait. Mm -hmm. We've got a really strong bond. And then ideal and flaw. And once again, much like Ernesto de la Cruz, <laughs> slash Jorge de la Cruz, as he's also known in the in the written tradition, mm -hmm. that um, they're very Frank similar. the D author. Yes, they're the very D similar. So... What do you think? I first ideal versus flaw. I was thinking basically what we said when I read uh -huh. through these that I don't want another family. I don't want any family. Family suck for the ideal. Mm -hmm. And then for the flaw, I don't want to see you again for the rest of my whole life, and I don't want to see anybody else either. Those were mm -hmm. those are the ones I was thinking. But or what are you thinking? Um, I'm just I'm looking at this house is you know <sighs> the house of filthy people makes me sick. That's it does not. Though when I grow up and get married, I'm living alone. Like, that's, that's such a telling line, because it is that sort of... Longing for companionship, Longing for companionship, but, but rejecting it. Yeah. But that's, like, a little, like, I have to explain it. Yeah. Like, I'd have to explain. If you saw that, you'd be like, what? And I'm like, oh, well, what I'm trying to say here is, I'm like, oh, okay, but I can't do that in the write-up. Yeah, yeah. So, but in the flaw, I don't want to see anybody else either. Yeah, let's go. Let's, let's cool that. I don't want to see you again. So, again, much like De La Cruz, whatever his first name might happen to be, we have... <laughs> And which I like, like many like well written characters, mm -hmm. their ideal and their flaw are sort of two sides of the same coin. Yeah, that it's it's the same basic impulse, but it's whether it's sort of their version of the impulse, how they would tell it to other people, versus how it causes them to make mistakes and errors. Mm -hmm. I think I think it was similar for Lotso too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And flaw went hand in hand. We kept we kept orbiting the same mm -hmm. couple of quotes about. Being self -mastery not, about self mastery and, yeah. and not needing anyone. And yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so cool. We have yeah. our powers. We have our base stats. We have our quotes. That wraps up our discussion of our Dark Lord Kevin McAllister or some other name. And <laughs> thus, we now can talk about something we have dropped a little bit of, of hints about. We can talk a bit about the very small but very trap filled domain that he is Lord of. 
the old McAllister house, as as that legend in many villages across the domains of Ravenloft, in a section that we like to call the land. The land. On its surface, the McElminster House consists of nothing but the house itself and its surrounding grounds. My later investigation of the manor showed that, while it was unlikely to contain anything specific to my patron's goals, my impression of powerful magic had been genuine. Kevin employs constructs and monstrous guardians, potent magical and technological traps, and unseen servants that cater to his every whim. When I made an early attempt to explore the grounds, I glimpsed three ghastly silhouettes that seemed plucked directly from my own nightmares. The sight froze my breath in my throat and sent me fleeing. Of course, once I was well beyond the grounds, I knew it for an illusion or a fear spell, but it must have been a powerful one to overcome my ring of protection. Despite the occasional couriers and deliveries, Kevin seems desperately paranoid about his privacy. I say that it seems to contain only the house and its grounds because of some odd rumors I heard during my stay. Apparently, there have been recent sightings of such local terrors as the Sturban Shovel Slayer and the Bird Woman of the Balanox. When I pressed the tale tellers for more information, I found odd similarities between these legends and others. The Sturban Shovel Slayer sounded much like the dreaded Silbervis Assault Man or the Brigdaro Bludgeoner. The Bird Woman, for her part, matched similar tales whispered from Valachan to Harakir. Before my patron begins one of his beloved lectures, yes, I am familiar with Hans Gleam's theory of bogeymen, the fey creatures that are given life by children's stories and fears. However, I suspected if I were to dig deeply into the folklore of these places, I would find legends of the McElminster House there as well. I believe that if these beings truly are the type of bogeymen that Gleam describes, it is the fear of one particular child that animates them. So yeah, this is not one of our more expansive location-filled, <laughs> plot hook filled domains, because no. it's a house. You go to a house, you rob it, Kevin Home Alone to you at the end. At the end. <laughs> Once again, I, I like there is in canon a couple of uh, precedents for single house domains, and I think there's actually a lot of power for a house that's in the Manx. It really lets you get into that kind of classic haunted house story, but it's not a haunted house, it's only haunted by a very troubled little boy who is very good at say sadistic traps <laughs> and so yeah there's the house and let's talk a bit about the house and that is this is a dungeon right and once again and there's something interesting with having a domain that's basically a dungeon it is full of traps and i said i'll give you some examples of those for combat encounters we have got the giant spiders because of course there was like his father had giant spiders for magical stuff or kevin was able to get some regular spiders and use some magic to make them grow but we've got giant spiders we've also got some automatons one thing i mentioned the idea that the father had these like basic labor automatons that kevin has repurposed into horrible robot horrors (laughs) and it's just kind of our like the mannequins in the party Mm -hmm. when he's when he's playing rock around the christmas tree (laughs) now they're pretty fast and now they're pretty fast bears yes (laughs) Now they're like, this was supposed to be a little chef bot, but now it's got, you know, flamethrowers and scything blades and it's going to cook you. Um, We are also imagining that we have this animated boiler, that there was a boiler to give the house hot water that that had a fire elemental trapped inside. You know, Kevin's done some stuff with that to get like fire and heat to use for some of his traps, but he's also afraid of it. Because mm-hmm. once again, it's a Kevin with no character growth. Yes. So this is Kevin that's still afraid of the, he, of the he furnace. He has not said shut up to the furnace. Yes, he's still afraid of the furnace. And once again, that's something players can use. As you're navigating through the dungeon, you have a sadistic little imp stalking you and shooting you with magic missiles and <laughs> taunting you. But then like you notice he's afraid of the furnace. He's afraid of the boiler. He's afraid of the fire elemental inside of it. And that's something a player will pick up on and use and hopefully use strategically. Trying to think through some good example traps got me thinking a lot about the traps in Home Alone. Some Mm -hmm. are straightforward, like you open the door, a rope pulls on the blowtorch and burns your head and and (laughs) kills you. But there's a couple of them I think are especially useful for here. I've written in the notes, sadistic Gygaxian dungeon design. Yeah. That they are like multiple step traps. For our listeners who 
are not familiar with some of the Gygaxian yeah. second edition traps. What what are some of the I I, I myself oh, have never played Tomb of Horrors. No, I've never I've never Horrors, played it, but, but I've read about it. Um gosh, I'm trying to it's been a while since I've like looked at a summary of Tomb of Horrors. But there would be stuff. Okay, oh, I, I just, I just for for reason might be obvious to you, dear listener. I was, I was watching a video that was I'm putting the show notes. That was going through like Guy Gax did a thing that was kind of an Alice in Wonderland called Dungeon mm, Land. Mm-hmm. There's an Alice in Wonderland. It's like a big dungeon, and it would be like a lot of the places would be death traps. So like you go into the house and it just like shrinks and crushes you Mm -hmm. or a lot of like getting really nasty with the size changing in terms of like your equipment and your magic items. Mm. They don't change with you. Mm -hmm. So there'd be a lot of like, Oh, to get through the door, you have to do the potion of diminishment, which by the way, those diminishment enlargement spells were to do an Alice in Wonderland dungeon, Mm. but like your gear doesn't shrink. So you gotta leave all your gear behind. Yep, you you're, ba- you're naked. Uh, yeah, you're, you're naked. Yeah, uh, like you're, nothing. None of your stuff shrinks. You're a guy gax. You, yeah. Mm, or I, there are like PG rated podcasts. I can't finish that. There are bits where, like, when they're falling through the t- following the white rabbit, falling through the tunnel, when they can see all these like little bits of miniature like armor and equipment, and if you don't think to grab it, then there's not really a place you can get much miniature armor equipment, <sighs> or like you can get some magic items, but then when you do like return your normal size, they don't return with you, so you like don't really get any treasure from the yeah, like stuff Jeez. like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know there's one. I'm trying to we just... do not recommend doing traps like yeah, this, no. dear listeners, if you still want to have friends by the time the evening. Is yeah, over. yeah, yeah. Uh, with Tomb of Horrors, there's one where it's like. It's something with, the, like, an orb that annihilates yeah, it's, you. Yeah, it's, like... it's like a statue, an open mouth that's like a doorway. And there's, like, a level or two where you go in the mouth and kind of go down a slide to the next level. And then, like, the second or third time it shows up, it's actually got a sphere of annihilation in it. So if you go in, you're just... And there's no, like, saving throw. It's just... It's just no, mm-hmm. you are annihilated. You are immediately annihilated. And so, yeah. Like, stuff yeah. like that. But there are these multi-stage traps. So, Kevin... He doesn't just, like, do one, one-off one traps. He'll sometimes set up ones where there's, like, multiple steps to increase the damage. So the big example, you have got the... He's got the tar on the steps, on the floor. So Harry, uh, Marv takes off his shoes. Marv takes off his socks. Marv is, is, is pulling his way up the stairs. And then there's a the nail on the roof and paper. And they get a quiet place. <laughs> yes. And then he steps on the nail... And, like, that would not... No, it wasn't just that there's a nail for him to step on. It was, this trap is designed to have him get his shoes off, and then the nail comes. Mm -hmm. Or, in uh, Home Alone 2, there is, you know, he does the paint can, second paint can, and then he does, like, the the bar. So it's Mm -hmm. like, they, they think they know what's coming, you dodge the paint can, but then you're not expecting the second one, which Mm -hmm. is undodgeable. Yeah. So... In planning your Home Alone traps, keep that in mind. And once again, I've tried to give you a list of potential Home Alone traps that are these kind of like multi-stage traps where a thing happens, which sets up for another thing to happen, which sets up for a worse thing to happen. The In D&D terms, there's a lot of traps starting with debuffs. Mm, yeah, yeah. And then another thing that we have here is that there's there's the bit where like the lights are off, and so yeah. Marv reaches up and pulls another string that he thinks goes to the light, but it makes the iron drop on his head. Mm-hmm. So for that, the uh, the D and D equivalent will be there's a really obvious spell uh-huh. that you should cast to solve this puzzle, but that spell is going to backfire on you in some yeah, horrible yeah. way. Like there's a door that's sealed with an arcane lock and you cast knock but there was also like arcane locks holding up the ceiling so yeah. when you cast knock it actually or there's something sound not makes a big booming sound mm-hmm. so something where like the sound triggers some second secondary effect yeah we also can get into it doesn't just need to be physical damage you have the honestly most sadistic point which was torturing the pizza delivery yeah! <laughs> boy, that's kind of the sort of insane paranoid <laughs> homeowner that we're imagining our version of Kevin that's where we're drawing it most from so you can have things with casting fear mind affecting stuff using sounds that like are sounds that connected with fears of the players kind of the equivalent of some, some kind of like phantasmal killery type stuff or mm-hmm. nightmare type stuff but so you do have you can draw from the movies and actually get some of those more like psychological traps as well and then the, the other thing that we had mentioned being here beyond the house and the traps and everything the, the other kind of hook that we have for you to explore 
is those lost souls, like Old Man Marley and the Pigeon Lady. Old Man Marley, because it is a well-made movie, mm-hmm. he has a connection with Kevin and their, their situations have resonance. The Pigeon Lady, because she is a direct knockoff yeah, yeah. of Old Man Marley, also has resonance. I had my heart broken once by someone I love, and now I'm flipping homeless. And <laughs> that talk with Kevin's really turned my life around. Yeah. So they have this kind of resonance and connection and something about the house kind of draws them in and like kind of has them be wandering around being strange hobos Mm -hmm. around the house. And Kevin is afraid of them. Like something about them is going to be reflecting Kevin's fears. Mm -hmm. And part of it is that he recognizes himself in them. Mm -hmm. That like he does kind of like see old man Marley and be like, this is me. This is who I'm going to be mm-hmm. when I'm an old man. Mm-hmm. Part, part of him acknowledges that and is terrified of him. Mm-hmm. That's, what, that's part of why he's just so irrationally afraid of them. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of, they're eking out a living on the ground or, you know, once again, they're going yeah. out into the village and but living they, like, there until they come back. back. Yeah. And they're able to help or guide the PCs. The PCs can kind of break them out of sort of the rut that they're in mm-hmm. and kind of the cycles are trapped in. They can have that church scene with yes, them. Yes, you can be Kevin in the church you scene. You can be Kevin in the church scene, yeah. The problem of the sort of Dark Lord stasis, Ravenloft domain stasis, unless you want to change things a lot, like obviously you're the GM, do whatever you want, but in, in sort of general canon Ravenloft rules, you can't like save Kevin. Like this is his torment. He's stuck here. You can't give Strahd a copy if he's not that into you and he stops pining for Titania. It's just they're stuck in their ruts. But the great thing is you can have the church scene. You Mm -hmm. can have the uh, opera house scene with the pigeon lady. You can break them. You can save that. And I think the the way to kind of use these guys, too, that they're having them look frightening is, again, your PCs also are going to hear at first that they're the shovel slayer, that the pigeon lady, like, has her murder birds or whatever. That they're kind of being forced into these scarier roles Mm -hmm. because that gives you, you know, the thrill of discovery that they're actually Mm -hmm. not so bad and be forced into this. Like, you you want to have that that whole kind of bit where you think that they're the the bad guys also, mm-hmm. or maybe even that they're working for Kevin, mm-hmm. and then you find out that they're not and you're able to save them. Mm-hmm. And the great thing is, since they are connected to the house, they spend time there, they can, like, help the PCs. Yes. They can guide them, they can show them back doors, they can warn them about traps, they can, like, scare Kevin away. So they can he hit can't Kevin in the stuff. face of a snow shovel. In the face of a snow shovel, as many of us parents have <laughs> possibly... <laughs> thought of in our in moments in moments when our children start repeating some of his lines uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> and get banned from watching home alone for a month or, you know for, for just random, random, random yeah. <laughs> that old chestnut so yeah that's that's the great thing that they they are incredibly useful npcs and you once again you have like the dungeon and another feature of classic dungeons, you know, even Gygaxian dungeons, to be, to be fair to, to Mr. Gygax, is the sort of NPCs you can win over. Mm-hmm. And the idea that, no, it's not just combat and traps. A really good classic dungeon includes social stuff as well. Includes role-playing stuff. And includes the idea that you can... There are NPCs you can win over. There's NPCs you can make alliances with. And that makes it much easier. Yeah. And that's like our thing here. Is these are the guys you can win over you can make alliances with and then that's like another way of sort of beating quote unquote the dungeon is befriending the residents before you beat that dungeon whether through getting through the traps whether through fighting giant spiders whether through befriending a pigeon lady or (laughs) an old trouble man you have to first get to that dungeon and what kind of story would get your players to that dungeon that's always a big thing of it how do you get them into the spooky haunted house full of traps (laughs) rachel what do you do with it Dread Possibilities After another failed attempt to penetrate the defenses of the McElminster house, I found a pair of shabby-looking men sitting in a horse cart outside the grounds. They greeted me, and as they asked a series of questions that they surely thought were subtle, it became clear that they were burglars who were sizing up the house to rob it, and that they suspected me of being the same. I sensed in them the same obsession that had briefly gripped me. They were convinced that it contained very fine jewelry, a possible cash hoard, and toys for some reason. No doubt these were the men who had robbed the house that I had arrived in. While I had no illusions that the two were master thieves, they had clearly been staking out the house for some time, and if I wished to learn Kevin McElminster's secrets, it would behoove me to seek assistance even if they provided nothing but an extra target for his spells. I was able to convince them that our chances of breaking into the house were better if we worked together. That evening, 
we returned to the McElminster house. I refuse to recount the indignities that were heaped upon me in that house. Suffice it to say that, as mentioned, Kevin McElminster specializes in traps. I am certain that my hair will grow back, and in the meantime, Borka has excellent wig makers. The precise traps I encountered between entering the house and burning my way out of the giant spider's web are far less important than what I learned about the creator of those traps. As I picked my way around a series of caltrips, I saw that the walls of the house were lined with family portraits. But all the faces had been slashed away, save that of a smirking golden-haired boy. The house's library was filled with spellbooks of breathtaking power, but their pages were sticky with jam and smeared with clotted cream. In the laboratory, which was littered with elaborate clockwork playthings, I found a circle that appeared to contain glyphs for a spell of planar travel, but the lines were smudged. I do not know precisely what would have happened to anyone within that circle, but I do not envy them. Kevin shouted taunts in a child's high and mocking voice with every trap we encountered, but only showed his face in moments when he believed himself to be invincible, such as when I dangled upside down from a snare lined with vicious metal teeth. However many years he had been alone in that house, his face and manner were still those of a boy of eight. And like any bullying child, while his jeers were triumphant, there was terror behind his eyes. And across his entire face, once my eldritch blast struck it. I want adventure in the great wide somewhere. I want it more than I can tell. So, Rachel, why did you... why did your players come to the spooky old McElminster house? Well, our go-to here because... Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, we don't want it to necessarily be that you're automatically robbing the McElminster stuff, getting silver tunage and everything, because that's... Uh, uh, don't be butt puppets. Don't, don't be butt puppets. <laughs> like... <laughs> Please do not whammy your PCs to make them think the thing they want is in the McElminster house, and then they find out that it is. Yeah, no, that that'd be that'd be a, you, that'd be a bad move. You'd be Gary Gygax, man. Don't yeah. do that. The yeah. thing I learned with a lot of DMing is that with Dungeons and Dragons, especially PCs, players, they want to be cool. Yes, and no one's less cool than Harry and Marv. <laughs> Except maybe Vlad Except maybe Vlad <laughs> So don't use your omniscient GM powers to make your players be Harry and Marv. Yeah. <laughs> that would not be cool. Mm -hmm. But the thing with the McAllister house, we've, we've mentioned, I'm going to be switching back and forth with McElmeister and McAllister, like, as, as mm. I already have been, interchangeably, because they're the McAllisters, but McElmeister is so fun to say. Yes, it is. <laughs> but so he's getting these deliveries. And so someone has to deliver stuff. So he's, he's ordering things. He's pranking the delivery people. And if he's at a place long enough, or mm -hmm. if he's been to a place before and then comes back, no one wants to deliver stuff right, there yeah. anymore. The only way you're going to be able to deliver stuff there is if you get a massive fee. Uh-huh. So if your PCs are short on cash, then this is this is a way to oh no no you just like make this one simple delivery do this one simple job right and you're gonna get so much money and the, the great thing is you can have a, a great setup here of like they go they what is some business them store they interact with says I have this delivery I will pay you hundreds of gold to do the delivery because this person pays so much and all of my regular delivery people are afraid because they say the house is haunted. Mm -hmm. And your players are like, all right, mm. we're doing a haunted house. <laughs> and then you home alone them. Yeah. Because, and then it's Kevin. Because it's not ghosts. It's angels with filthy souls. <laughs> yes. Uh, that would be fun. That would be a fun, like, end the session with the reveal that we're in a home alone. <laughs> That we are, in fact, Harry and Marv. Yeah. But we chose to be Harry and Marv, and that's the critical difference. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. And because, because Kevin is... When the delivery people come, he doesn't want them to get any bright ideas about attacking his house. Uh -huh. so he's, he's getting the delivery people to come, but he's scaring them away. Partly because he's paranoid and doesn't want them to get any bright ideas, and partly because Kevin is a little sadist. Yeah, right. Much like Gary Gygax. Yes. Also, he's just boredom. Mm -hmm. Like, there's something to do. It's like we mentioned the whole maintaining a lot of his day is maintaining the house and he's so paranoid and you know that kind of mindset you're going to be turning on the recording of barking dogs to chase chase off delivery people and like he'll pay mm -hmm. cuz he wants this he needs this stuff and he wants more delivery people to come he will be like 50 gold of groceries and a 200 gold tip <laughs> but then I'll scare them off because he's a bored little sadist. But Tom, 
them, they make this delivery to the haunted house, they right. get angels of filthy souls, but that sounds like the end of the session. How do you actually get them to go into yes, the house? Yes, because, you know, our pizza delivery guy, he is the one who made his mistake. He is yes. the one that, like, did the rational thing of being like, now I'm gonna leave. <laughs> I dropped off my pizza, now I'm gone. Unlike Harry and Marv. So, don't use the mind whammy, don't silver tune in them yet. You can do that later when they go in. I think a couple possibilities. Uh, one, honestly, if just Kevin plays a prank on them when they deliver, like as we mentioned, it, you might not need to want mind whammy them to get them to Harry and Marv <laughs> to be like, no, I don't care how many traps we set off. We're getting this little jerk. We're gonna fry his cojones and motor oil. Like, like what you did, you little jerk. Yeah, we're we're gonna get this kid. We're gonna nail this kid to the wall. Like, <laughs> bite all his little fingers off. Right. Yeah. Time. Like, the, the, the many, many parties I have interacted with, like, that would be enough yeah, of just yeah. an NPC, like, humiliates them and mocks them, and they're like, we will die to get this guy. Like, yes. to get revenge. Mm -hmm. You could have it be that they're approached by someone else who gets them to go in. So someone's like, hey, I know you're making this delivery, I want to go in and I need your help. But maybe they offer them more money. Uh, maybe they were a previous delivery person. <laughs> Nero's pizza voice getting revenge. Yeah, right? I mean, he deserves it. Yes, and he does. Why did you do that, Kevin? He didn't do anything <laughs> to you. That maybe you could have someone, oh, I made a previous delivery and I was able to swipe a key or I was able to, like, you know, find an exit that seemed to be unguarded and... There's a sort of there's the initial delivery job, but after they get the delivery job, someone approaches and like says, Oh, and if you help me get in, and if you like, you know, guard me while I get in to like get whatever I'm going after or do whatever I'm trying to do, that's a possibility. Especially if they're like, I'm not Punch asking this kid in the head. you to do this, I'm just asking you to kind of like escort me. Mm -hmm. Um, it could be that Kevin taught them with a thing they need as part of our mind whammy. There is a magical MacGuffin, and Kevin's just able to tell what it is and a particular magic item they really, really want or they need, and he's able to taunt them with it. Because since this is a very magical house, if there's a magical thing that they're looking for, Kevin might actually have. Like, if you're going to have the PCs yes. go in and rob the house looking for a specific thing, please have Kevin have the thing. Yes, yes, yes. Like, do not, do not mind when we them to think that he has a thing and then he doesn't. But and that that actually could be a valid, like, okay, PCs, you want this one MacGuffin? Sure, because you got a home alone to get it. Oh, right, right. If those of you saw Dungeons & Dragons movie, if it's mm -hmm. like the, oh, we need to get into the vault, we need this helmet. And they go to, like, the magic store that they'd heard had it. And the guy's like, oh, well, I spent my last helm of whatever to the old McElminster place. Delivered it, you know, a week ago. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, okay then. Yeah. Uh, another possibility is you have a kind of Harry and Marv and one of them approaches you, especially if, like, Kevin pranked them and drove them off and says that, like, look, we tried to rob the place, probably shouldn't have done that, but my partner's still trapped in there. And so... <laughs> no one deserves No one deserves it. And they see Home Alone. They're like, oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> so, I'm like, look, let me rescue him. Let me, like, give his remains for a proper burial. Just... And that could be the sort of tugging on the heartstrings mm -hmm. of, of... We're not... We're not doing selfish motives. We're not trying to rob the house. But, like, no, it's it's not right. Yeah, yes, the guy was a burglar, but, like, does not deserve to be unburied or trapped in a sadistic fun house yeah, for, yeah. until he dies. And then for other non-loot... Uh, motivations. I, th I don't remember which episode we mentioned this in, but there was a there was a supplement that had the the phrase you can e get the PC mm. either by tugging for strings or tugging uh -huh. heartstrings. And for another one, if you're tugging heartstrings options, you could be hard to investigate what happened to the family. All right to Kevin's um, family. To Kevin's family. Yeah. The McGillmisters. Uh, like, the McGillmisters. Right? Why they all disappeared? So like. You know, there there was the brother that they were going to go visit. Maybe he hires you to find out what happened. And so you're just, you're going to go and you're going to see what happened to them. Um, or he, he certainly appears to be rolling in cash, mm -hmm. flying like 13 people to Paris. Yeah. And it kind of kind of tying into between the investigating the family and looking for loot. You could have it be that they know that Kevin's dad, being this powerful wizard, like had this you know, amazing magical book in his study, mm -hmm. and you gotta you gotta go in and find it. And you know, Kevin has 
possibly been using it for toilet paper at this point because what does he do with magical books but and the great thing with the Uncle Rob stories another one of those where you can do like a great reverse a great twist of like mm-hmm. hey my sister-in-law and her family were supposed to visit me for Yule and this was like a two years ago and I haven't heard anything from them and they seem to have disappeared I want you to go investigate and they're like oh okay, okay. and they go they get home alone yes <laughs> <laughs> they disappeared, and now their house is rumored to be haunted. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah, all right. Okay. They got Kevin eaten by ghosts, or now our ghosts. And Kevin shows up. So yeah, we. What the, the, there's a lot of reasons to come. We hope we've given you a couple options, other than that silver tuna, and they maybe have a DVD player. <laughs> and we've given you some interesting things that could get you there. But then there's something we've hinted at a couple of times, and that is there's a wide spectrum of how you want to interpret this yeah. in the context of Ravenloft and horror. And so in our drag possibilities, we have our aging down section, our aging up section, our aging down section. What if we are playing this with the aforementioned youngest child who watched Home Alone every day for a couple of weeks? And number one, we don't do the Ravenloft stasis and poor stasis. You bring his family back. That's the thing. If you're doing this with younger players, you are the old man in the church. You give him the church scene. You give him his character growth. Mm-hmm. Like, you you get Kevin out of this curse. You bring the family back. That's absolutely the number one point I would make if I were doing this with younger players. It would yeah. not be like Kevin is in a hell of his own creation for yes. eternity because he's a little ass. <laughs> no. Uh, this, is, this is fundamentally, in this version... Kevin is good at heart. He is redeemable. He acted in a very bad way, but Mistakes a very understandable way. Mistakes were made, but like you can bring it back and you can bring bring the family reunion and he hugs his mom and he's sorry and they both apologize. They both forgive each other and happy ending. You basically, you do Home Alone. Mm-hmm. Also, violence here is going to be very Looney Tunes violence, even I think more so than the movies. Yeah. Hit points are a good abstraction, you know. Like, you say a iron falls and hits you and you take on the head and you take X points of damage. That's a kind of a nice, abstract, Looney Tunes violence thing. Mm-hmm. With terms of the traps, you've got kind of two paths you could take. One is, it, there's a very good chance kid players are going to be angry at these sadistic traps. Mm-hmm. Like, these are meant to be mean. Mm-hmm. And, like, in the movie, they're meant to be mean. And you could, in that case, if you want that kind of element of meanness... You you kind of don't have the redeemable. You make him like maybe an adult. You just you shit. You have the idea of Kevin, but he's not like that. Like you yeah. ke- you don't want Kevin to be the figure they identify with if he's going to do stuff that makes them angry. Yeah, there are kind of two ways to go with an aging down Kevin, and one is that he's the kid and uh-huh. he's Kevin from the movie, and you save him. And the other one is basically you have the Home Alone dungeon. Uh huh. But the guy in the Home Alone dungeon isn't Kevin. Right. Because if your kids love Home Alone, they're not going to want to fight Kevin. So, but there can be, like, this, you know, wizard man-child yes. adult who's putting them through all He's of this. He's Macaulay Culkin from that Amazon Prime commercial from a year or two ago. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing, if you want to preserve the Kevin, if you're like, my kids love Kevin, I want to have him as a cameo, I want to have him appear in my game, they'd really get a kick out of that, is you make the trap sillier and less sadistic. Mm-hmm. And, like, you do have the one that serves no purpose to, except to make Harry look silly, which is, like, the glue and the feathers. I, I've, I read that the director even, like, he was like, this is stupid. Uh, all of the other traps are really sadistic. But he had the, Harry had the feathers on in later scenes, so he couldn't just cut it. Ah. <laughs> like, yeah. He was like, I actually, I actually want to cut this scene, but I can't. <laughs> Continuity. Yeah. And, you know, you could do, once again, less of the blow torches to the head and more of the falling down. And, mm-hmm. like, that still might be annoying, but it's not going to be, like, maybe getting under their skin and getting them as angry as, like, stepping on nails or having blow torches on their head. And there's just a lot of slipping on ice and slipping on micro machines. Mm-hmm. And-, and, and if you are doing, again, the identifying with Kevin, the doing the power fantasy, the having Kevin say a kid, mm-hmm. um, there's another Home Alone adventure mm-hmm. that we're going to link to in the show notes because yeah. it's great. W- Watsy actually, Watsy did it as a uh, official, like, a holiday session. So there's a lot of names changed as, as we were doing. So mm-hmm. you can't mm-hmm. get mad at as Watsy because you did it first. Um, <laughs> and it was, it starts with the PCs are hired by, like, this Thieves Guild agent to burgle the house. They get home alone, but then they, like, discover 
the Thieves Guild was just sort of sending them through as patsies to kind of basically human human trap disarmaments. <laughs> They're just kind of sending them through to clear out the traps and the Thieves Guild was going to go in. And the little Kevin, in this case, was a wizard's familiar who the wizard left. And the little wizard's familiar was like, oh no, can you help me fight them? So then they got to do the Home Alone. They got to be the Kevin. The, the GM was really clever. Like, he gave them a list of supplies and said, basically, each of you can come up with a trap based on these supplies. And then ran that encounter where they're, like, leading the other Thieves Guild members through the house and setting off the traps they make. Yeah. Like, that's the dream. That's the dream. So, like, it's, if you're if you're playing with sympathetic Kevin, I think that it needs to be definitely followed up with them getting to be Kevin. Because yes, if yes. they're kids, that's what they want to do. That's what they want to do. They want to, like, oh, man, oh, my goodness, how many traps our youngest uh, was making mm-hmm. after his big home alone, or enduring his big home alone binge. Yeah. But what if they are adults... And they're adults who maybe have a little less identification and sympathy with that sadistic little brat. Mm -hmm. And what if you want to age up this story? If you want to age up this story, I don't... I don't think this is going to be one where we need to give you a skip ahead warning. Yeah, uh, we're right. Yeah. Future Rachel might come in and eat those words in a minute, but we'll see what happens. Basically, if you want to re-age this up, like... You're going to be doing Peter Pan on steroids Yes, here. yes, yes. Just all the bratty stuff we were talking about with Peter Pan, with the power fantasy that Peter Pan has, but without the charisma, oh, without yeah, the yeah. charm, and without wanting to have friends. Uh-huh. Like, that's that's the one thing you can say about Peter Pan, is that he loves the lost boys when he's looking at them. Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> he doesn't have object permanence, but when he's making eye contact with the lost boys, he really does love them. Yes, that. yes. And, like, Kevin does not have that. And part of it... For how much you're going to make him be, Kevin, you know, we talked a little bit in the Aging Down about having him maybe be like a sadistic wizard adult if you wanted to have him be a pure villain. Mm. Um, read the room. How much do your players hate Kevin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe like, bring up Home Alone maybe bring up Home a couple Alone. weeks before yeah. you're planning the uh-huh. session. Because there, there are some people who still have great affection yes, for Kevin. Yes. There are other people who are like, now that I'm an adult, I want to kick this kid right, out of the I building. I hate this little guy. Yeah. But by the way, no matter how we're talking, we are more in the former camp. Yes, but yes, every yes. now and then. Every now and then. You know. Especially in two. Ugh. Oh, good <laughs> You want to hate Kevin. Watch. If you like, I, I really want to psych myself up to make Kevin a little b- then. <laughs> That was one of so many bleeps. Then watch, watch two, watch Home Alone two. Mm-hmm. Ugh, he is. He's the worst. A real little Ugh. jerk in that one. Yeah. When you're when you're running him, having this well, cruel, awful, spoiled child with no conscience. Yeah, yeah. Is really scary. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're not doing Macaulay Culkin as Kevin McAllister. You're doing Col- Macaulay Culkin from The Good Son. Mark your bingo cards for a Kohler generation mm-hmm. <laughs> reference. And if you're not of our generation, Google it. Yeah. So just the whining. Like, if you beat any of his traps, he throws a tantrum because it's no fair that you beat his yeah, yeah. trap. Like, just sadistic little plucking the wings off flies, yeah, yeah. kid. Just the most awful nightmare child you can imagine who knows deep down that his family left him because he's the worst. <laughs> Once again, this is not what we think of actual no, Kevin, no, no. but this is how you could totally run Dark Lord Kevin, mm-hmm. who is a lot like Ivan Delisnia the yes. more we talk about him. So, you know, <laughs> speaking of whining, tantruming man Well, children, maybe go to the uh, uh, Borka section of mm-hmm, uh, Van Ruten's mm-hmm. Guide for some suggestions. Yeah, yeah. If you're all like, yes, I love this, I want him to be the worst person in the world... I do not want my PCs beating up a small yeah, child. I don't want them to murder a child. <laughs> then you could really easily go, once again, speaking of Ivan Delisnia, yeah? uh-huh. have him be this huge man child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Decades have passed. He's grown up physically. Mentally, he's still a child. You know, he tantrums. He whines. He believes the world revolves all around mm. him. He buys entire social media platforms yeah. so that they can be praising him constantly. Yeah, you know, you know, the yeah, kind of you know, like, just the yeah. random example. <laughs> like, like... Once you're an adult, a, like, sadistic child with power is terrifying. But maybe even more terrifying is, like, a sadistic man-child with power. Mm -hmm. Is like you encounter an adult and they are 
acting like a spoiled child. Yeah, give him all the vocals, like all right. the, the dialogue of a child, all mm-hmm. the mannerisms of a child, mm-hmm. but he's like 40 years old. And that's all just, that's creepy. Ugh. And that's also like, once again, your players are immediately going to get how like horrible and dangerous this person is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And as we mentioned up top, this is technically an AU because it is Ravenloft. This is something you can do in Ravenloft. But I think the vast, unless you're really miserableists, mm-hmm. the, or really hate Kevin, the vast majority of people who are going to have fun at a homo inspired Ravenloft adventure for the holidays, you're going to want the happy Christmas ending. Yeah. You're going to want that. Unless, once again, you go for this villain who is completely, as like, you just completely remove him from Kevin as much as possible. And, and, and you want your just, like, fun monster mash splatterpunk dungeon crawl Christmas. Mm-hmm. Sounds great, too. That could be fun, too. And the great thing is, like, this we're doing it as a domain, and he's a dark lord, but it doesn't need to be a domain. Mm-hmm. This could just be a curse, you know? And once we, we, we've touched on this, that one of the most underused and very useful things in Ravenloft, especially in this case, for if you want to have a, a dark lord adjacent story without the dark lord plot armor or, or stasis is those people that are being corrupted by the dark powers because mm-hmm. they are not locked in to to what they're doing. So it could be just once again, he made his family disappear, he wished it, he messed up the spell, the dark powers like reached out and sort of corrupted him and gave him this curse, or maybe the curse was even just an effect of this magic that he was doing mm-hmm. unconsciously, but it's not a domain with a dark lord. And there are plenty of haunted houses in Ravenloft that are not domains, they're just cursed haunted houses. There's also, um, if any of you have seen the Russian movie Night Watch, which mm-hmm. you should, it's great. It's really good, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil part of it for you. But there's this woman who's under a curse, and they find out she actually cursed herself. Mm-hmm. And you can have it be that, like, Kevin feels so guilty that he did this to his family that he has cursed himself. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And that you need to get him to break this curse that he has put on and himself. That, and that's your happy Christmas. And that gives you our church scene. Like, yes. You could be the, the old man. Well, you can old man Marley, you can have the church scene, you can help him realize his mistakes, and once he sort of forgives himself, repents, the curse is broken, his family comes back, they hug, happy Christmas ending, everybody <laughs> goes home with the Yuletide glow. And another old AU, because this is not uh, related to this, this is not something we are doing in the sort of canon version of the domain, but it's a cool possibility, is that the lost souls could be his family. Yeah, this was a thing... That we came up with because we were thinking about um, the pigeon lady and how he's running away and afraid of the pigeon lady. And so much of the ending of Home Alone 2 comes from like his reconciling with the pigeon lady. Uh-huh. And we're doing this whole thing with him wanting to reconcile with his mother that he never gets that reconciliation. And what if the pigeon lady is his mother? Whoa. Like, what if he's kind of transformed his family into these figures that terrify him because they're sort of representing the things about his family that he dislikes but also longs for uh-huh. and is feeling guilt about. So, like, the pigeon lady is his mother. Like, maybe you could have some, something where she had pet birds. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like, she's just, you know, she looks like this terrifying hag with all these birds all over uh-huh. her, but underneath it, her, his mother is in there. And you could have Buzz be an ogre uh-huh. um, or a troll or something like that. Fuller is a water element, of course. Of course. And when you get him to recognize and acknowledge that there's family, like you, the PCs, you, once again, you talk Mm -hmm. to them, you get the church scene, you find out who they really are, and you're able to bring them and reconcile them with Kevin. Right, right. And then that's, you have that scene of forgiveness. Either way, you know, whether you want them to be his random lost souls, not being at all, be his transformed family. And this is also fun. The transformed family could be good because it could be a way to bring in those other characters. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I really want to bring in the mom. I really want to bring in Uncle Frank. I really want to <laughs> bring in Buzz. Like, Gosh, what is this Uncle is a way to do it. Real jerk. <laughs> Just a real, real bad dude. Just the worst. Um, that you can then have them. You can even have this sort of, wait a minute, this portrait of the family. Why, that ugly looking, dull eyed older brother. He's got the same, like, very similar face to the troll that was there. Or this, you know, once again, that that little cousin looks like the water elemental. They've got that similar facial features. And, the yellow water elemental. Yeah, you've got, you've got the, like, trail of clues. And once again, that gives you a sort of um, an aha moment to have in the dungeon also be the sort of mystery. And then they solve the mystery, and then they can bring the reconciliation. Mm-hmm. They can help the people remember who they are. They can talk to Kevin. And it can actually be solved through the role-playing, and like investigation role-playing. 
If I were to run it, that's probably that's probably the version that I would. Uh-huh, run, uh-huh. This version with the family gives you that heartwarming ending, yes. but you also are going having to go through the uh, through his little fun house in <laughs> in order to find that to solve the mystery. So, so while the Kevin is Dark Lord is an inherently deeply bleak concept, we hope that we've given you a couple of possibilities for whether it's children. Or adults who just love Home Alone and you know, don't mind Kevin that much. <laughs> you can have this be a heartwarming Christmas session. And then we'll finally give you our parting thoughts on that potential heartwarming Christmas session or incredibly bleak deconstruction <laughs> of Kevin as, a, as an immature sadist man-child. And give you our parting thoughts in a section we like to call... Parting Thoughts. So the first thing we like to do in the parting thoughts section is talk about the genres of horror. These are from Van Rijnaz Gravenloft. As regular listeners are aware, and because we say this every time, <laughs> it is a great chapter. It's a section about genres of horror, genre expectations. It's really useful for any kind of horror jamming, I think. And it includes listing the genres for different domains. So the idea is that helps you kind of tailor the horror, the specific type of horror you're trying to get from that domain. And so this one is trickier than some of the others. I thought it was incredibly easy, but only for one genre. Like, there's one genre, Mm -hmm. it absolutely is, and after that, I got nothing. What do you got? Slasher. Yes, slasher. (laughs) Like, if you do a horror version of Home Alone, Kevin is Jigsaw. Yes. Uh, Actually, actually, speaking of a horror Mm -hmm. version of Home Alone, Uh in either the late 80s or early 90s, there was a really good Wes Craven movie called The People Under the Stairs. Oh, yeah, you've told me about this one. And most of it is set in this house, this, like, boarded-up mansion where this crazy couple has been just been building, like, traps and secrets and things like that because they're terrified of, like, burglars and stuff. Mm-hmm. And they've been doing that for, like, their whole lives. So, honestly... Hard R Home Alone, that's a metaphor for racism, is not, like, a terrible (laughs) summary of the people under the stairs. So, like, if you wanted to run a super bleak, horrible, nasty, aging up Home Alone game, watch the people under the stairs and just do that, but have it be a little blonde cherub and not these two horrible Ronald and Nancy Reagan-esque characters. Yeah, honestly, and, and to a lesser extent than what you've told me about the people under the stairs, but even, like, that episode of X-Files with the hill yeah, yeah, is basically uh, home. home alone. Yeah. Home! Home! home. Yeah, there home you go. Alone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. The Architects yep. Chainsaw Massacre is home. alone. So uh, there's, uh, there's the collector... A- the collector sort of a, a mo- you could take the Home Alone stuff mm-hmm, from there if you want some mm-hmm. really nasty traps. Just yeah, like yeah, this and those are all slasher movies those are all basically. Slasher movies, yeah, those are all more or less slasher movies or slasher TV episodes. So yeah, absolutely. Bizarrely enough, as much as you might be surprised when she first said it, I absolutely agree. The obvious choice is slasher. He is Jigsaw. Yep. Full stop. You want to play your game? Are you thirsty for more? Are you thirsty for more? You guys give up. Are you thirsty <laughs> for more? So, the other one I was thinking was psychological. Mm-hmm. And that is not so much in the settings we've established in canon, but we there is this subtext of the house kind of calling people's loneliness mm-hmm. and having a kind of mental effect. Like, it calls lost souls. It makes you obsessed with breaking in. It kind of is like bending your mind. Mm, you know, it yeah. calls the lost souls and sort of keeps them there. So we're saying that as more of an NPC thing. But if you used it on PCs or, you know, from the perspective of those NPCs, yeah. this is a kind of psychological horror. This is a, like, mind whammy house. That messes with your will, that messes with your desires, that maybe messes with your emotions, that kind of can can draw you there, then keep you trapped there. So I think, yeah, not as much with our version of things, especially from the PC's perspective, Mm -hmm. but there's an argument to be made for psychological Yeah, and if you go with the AU where his family are the Mm, people wandering around the grounds, that's gothic as all heck. That is gothic as all heck, yeah. The, The physical, the form, the past reaching into the present. The sort of past sin mm-hmm. that's living, that's manifesting in this kind of physical transformation. Yeah, gothic as heck. I think for the Van Richten's write up, I am going to do the slasher and psychological, because we do have those elements, mm-hmm. but with a capital S slasher. Yeah, yeah. Like this close to only being slasher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and once again, you could use those genres of horror as we've been saying. If you're like, 
I love this idea for a holiday session, <laughs> but I don't want a goofy lark. I want horror. Yeah. Then that's how you do it. You would, you would say, what is the genre? Slasher. And that tells you exactly how to lean into the genre to actually make this a horror setting. Yeah. So if you, if you want to do like a Home Alone inspired session for your PCs, but it's Leatherface mm. or Jigsaw or these horrible racists under the stairs. Yes. Uh, also, there is a Christmas horror movie that came out, I think, three or four years ago, five years ago, maybe. Time is a... Who knows? What is time? <laughs> Pre-pandemic or post... That, that Pre -pandemic. is the only movie measure things anymore. Um, okay. I believe it's called You Better Watch Out. Mm -hmm. And it was described as a sort of home alone, but Kevin is Macaulay Culkin from The Good Son. So... <laughs> Like, Kevin is just a spoiled little sociopath. Mm -hmm. So once again... Oh, so it's if, Home Sweet Home Alone. Exactly, okay. <laughs> yeah. If you are one of... We, we would not do that. We would run this as kind of a goofy holiday lark, I mm -hmm. think, uh, if, if I may speak for both of us. Yeah. But you're not us, and or you'd be doing the podcast. And <laughs> if you actually want to get a capital H horror, I think I would look at that movie as, as a very, you know, fertile source for like a new a different version of kevin like mm -hmm. kind of take the kid in that movie the kevin analog as how i would role play kevin in home alone but it's horrible and you're gonna get like murdered <laughs> so we we talk about in all of our domains some of them are barovia or uh -huh. darkon or in the right loving hands <laughs> Borka. among all right thinking <laughs> Unrighteous individuals. And you can play for years and years and years because why would you ever go anywhere but uh, Borka? What more do you need? <laughs> Others are there just they're there for a one shot. You're not going to play a years long mm. adventure on Star thirteen thirteen. Yeah, yeah. You get on the train, you find out who the passenger is, you have some kind of spooky train adventure, you get off, you're not gonna be spending months on Star mm -hmm. thirteen thirteen. And both of those are fine. Yeah, or like Valachan, it's the Hunger Games mm -hmm. slash most dangerous the most dangerous Hunger Games. The most dangerous Hunger and Games. And like there there's variability in terms of how much build up or how many like plot twists there are on the way mm -hmm. to the most dangerous Hunger Games, you know, how many <laughs> chapters before Katniss gets in the arena, mm -hmm. but like that's, that's it. He's going in the arena. Yeah. It's all just sort of build up. She's your your PCs are going on the Hunger Games. So, honey, how many years would your campaign of the McElmas be? Well, it's four stories. So <laughs> that's I think a good you know you make it like a hex crawl. That's a, a story a year. So I a, a floor of the house a year. Think we can get at least six mm -hmm. sessions out of this, but one of them they have to go to New York. <laughs> and do the same thing. Yes. Yes. So. So, yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's a one shot. It's, it's a one shot. Engine. It's a one shot. And that, then as we keep rotating, we have this core adventure here. Uh, we try and give a brief summary, talk more about it later, but it's basically it's Home Alone. It's yeah. The, the, the core adventure, however you iterate it, is it's Home Alone, you're Harry and Marv, you get in, you want something, maybe a DVD player, you... A v VCR, so VCR, it's the 90s, God, yeah. yes. Um, it wasn't even a VCR, a yeah. You, they have a VCR, you want that VCR. <laughs> None of the other houses you've robbed on this block, apparently, had a VCR. Maybe they all had VHS and you want a Betamax. <laughs> but you, you, you get in, you endure the traps in Kevin's Taunting, you maybe get the thing you were after and escape... Or you just escape. You like the, make the wisdom say that Harry and Marv never made and be like, you know what? Just, just go. We'll just get in our van and go. We got a van full of loot and we're we're out of here. But PCs being PCs, yeah, right. please let them beat the Pesnogolins out of Kevin. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Beat the Pesnogolins out of him or redeem him. Either is proper. Right, right. Morally speaking, beat the yes. Pesnogolins out of him. <laughs> and yeah, that's the, that's it. It's Home Alone. It's Home Alone. Even a lot more than a lot of our adaptations because this isn't like a city or a village or a country. It's a dungeon. Like even more than Toy Story. Yeah, yeah. Because Toy Story, you at least had Sid and right. Big Al. You had a town with a couple of yeah. like encounter locations for like side quests yeah this is a dungeon this is yeah. one house rachel last recording mm -hmm. i asked you <laughs> if there were any possible ways a victorian london where rat occult investigation domain with jekyll and hyde with jekyll and hyde could interface with the older, the 2E, 3E canon material. And you laughed at the absurdity of that question. <laughs> and now I'm going to ask you, is there any way that Home Alone... <laughs> 
can interface with the older material. Listeners, Tom can tell you this was my greatest challenge. This was staring at the screen for, like, <laughs> minutes passing, just seeing that little cursor blink. Because the thing with this, and if you wanted to do kind of like the more serious, creepy slasher mm. version of Home Alone that we were just talking about, you might be able to get something here. But if you're running it as a Home Alone session, it's yeah. so goofy. And like, the thing is, there is a genuine pathos to be wrung out of this, just like there is genuine pathos in Home Alone. Yes, like yes I, indeed. I tear up when he sees his mom and hugs her at mm-hmm. the end. The church scene. Mm-hmm. There was a whole thing in Seinfeld Yeah, right, it. the old yeah. man. Mm-hmm. He gets me. Yeah. He gets me. Um, but that's not probably what you're going to be doing in a mm-hmm. Home Alone gaming session, like, unless you're a very skilled GM. Yes. In which case, my hat's off. Kudos. If you are going to be able to get those darker themes for that pathos, then there, you know, there are a ton of people who are like, you know, various NPCs who are related to the Dark Lords and whatnot and have been alienated mm-hmm. from them. You know, you could run into Louise Rainier wandering around <laughs> the grounds. You could run into Sturm von Zara. Yes! <laughs> or Lissa. That's why Lissa got such an abbreviated write-up. Yes! In Van she made her family disappear. Yes, because if she's not in Barovia, she's wandering around the Miguel Minster uh-huh, house. Yes. And if you just... Let her free from the McElminster house, and she'll be able to go and sick vampire elephants on people in peace. Uh-huh. So you could do that, but it's so goofy. It's really so, goofy. Like, <laughs> unless you're really able to dive into the pathos, you're a better GM than I am if you can do that. <laughs> oh my gosh, though. <laughs> you could totally. I just realized. Yes. Here we are. Here we right. are. I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat, listeners. I don't know what's going to happen right now. Because this is this is this is live. Live, baby. baby. Is, if you want to do just a goofy, silly, or even loft magical Christmas episode, I do. I absolutely do. Carry on. Then you can have your home alone session that concludes with Ivan and Ivana tearfully hugging each other. <laughs> or the siblings in Calicari tearfully hugging each other. That. And they stop fighting and drink eggnog for one day. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> it's like a Christmas truce for Calicari. So, actually, you know what? Never mind. That's what I do. <laughs> All this again. Like, like, yeah, yeah, a- absolutely. If you just want to get goofy as heck and your PCs aren't super emotionally invested in some of these domains like Calicari or Borka that have, like, warring family members, but they were there, like, once so you can bring the the, uh, the Dark Lords back yes, for a cameo. Yes, yes, that's really funny. Do that. That's really good, yeah. <laughs> I also have an extremely silly suggestion. Mm-hmm. I'm going to let you take a sip because I, I don't want to. Okay, so Strahd has relatives. Yes. So what if <laughs> cannot wait. it was like the Yuletide family gathering of the Von Zarovich clan at Castle Ravenloft, mm-hmm. and one of them, let's say Sturm, made an angry Christmas wish? Oh, Sturm would never do that. Okay, who would make an angry Christmas wish? <laughs> I don't know, can- canonically wish? Sturm might do that, but I'm used to Twitter Sturm. Hi, Alter. Yeah. I'm used to Twitter Sturm, and he's the sweetest person in the world. But yeah. You know, um, let's I, say, I, so one of his family members <laughs> makes an angry Christmas wish, and they're all sort of banished so straw needs to like okay we are magically forbidden from going in so i'm gonna hire you pcs to go in and like undo oh whatever gosh, this yes. like magic item yes. is but in the meantime Sturm has filled the castle with traps and- <laughs> yeah sort of home alone in castle ravenloft you, you've probably all got the map yeah with fill the face with crude homemade traps <laughs> Just, if you specifically like, could I incorporate this into Curse of Strahd for my goofy holiday session? Yes. <laughs> there you go. Not yes. Non-canonical yes, goofy holiday session. <laughs> so the final thing I'd like to talk about is, uh, much sooner than we do in most episodes, mm-hmm. is the, it's one house, what am I going to do? <laughs> the strengths and the challenges. I feel like, dear listener, you can probably at least predict a couple of the challenges because <laughs> we've we've discussed at great length in the previous like couple of sessions some mm-hmm. of the challenges. But first, let's start with the strengths. First off, I think it is a great holiday hook. It is a perfect 
holiday one shot for a Ravenloft game, or if you don't want to be Raven, if you're not running a Ravenloft game, even a D and D game. Mm-hmm. This is just sort of the mist, as they often are, are just sort of the you know Star Trek transporter <laughs> that pulls the PCs into the adventure, and then they leave, and they're bad. You're back in the Forgotten Realms. You're back doing like Ghosts of Soul Marsh or whatever. But you just have this the mist rise up, and they're like Ravenloft, and then it's flippity home. <laughs> And that is going to be a fun holiday session. Whatever you're running is the realization of we're in Flippity Home Alone. Yeah, we thought we were, thought we were playing Team of Horrors. Yeah. We're playing Home Alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, But the great thing is you're in Home Alone, but it is true to Home Alone to have it be a dungeon full of sadistic traps. Yeah. So, like, you get that classic D&D experience. It's not just like, it's a session and we're going to save Santa and fight the Grinch and blah, blah, blah. No, it's a very classic D&D type experience of a, sadist- a dungeon full of sadistic traps. But that is a totally valid conversion of this property. You're not like, what if the Grinch were a demi and <laughs> Max was a hellhound? It's like, no, this, yes, of course Home Alone is a dungeon full of yes. sadistic traps. And they can be, the great thing is you have also a lot of variance in tone. And they can be, if you're kind of leaning into the sort of internet meme psychopath, Kevin, <laughs> they can be really brutal, brutal, horrible people under the stairs slash saw style traps. Mm-hmm. Or if you're like, no, we just having a good time, then the fact that it's Home Alone gives you an excuse for a lot of like Looney Tunes slapstick style traps that like, yes, we just had giant metal weights hit us in the head. But all that is, is we have little cartoon birds flying above our heads <laughs> and have lost a certain amount of hit points. Mm-hmm. We've like we've lost, I don't know, 22 hit points. And that's like, that's nothing. There's no brutality or viciousness there. D&D, very, the hit point system very much supports that kind of cartoony violence. Yeah. This is also a, as you said, a, a setting that really kind of leads into that hit point, mm-hmm. hit point system goofy violence. Uh, for younger players, once again, this could be a way to do kind of baby's first tomb of horrors if you want to give them uh, the sort of classic sadistic traps, but in a less like mean and horrible and like kind of frustrating experience. The fact that it's Home Alone and it's Kevin might take some of the sting out. Mm-hmm. And you can go bigger and broader... And also, in terms of if you're running specifically a Ravenloft game, this domain, like Darkon, is a domain it resembles in many ways. <laughs> is is a, a place where you can go bigger and broader with, like, the magic. That I know um, I've seen some complaints about people saying that D&D in 5e last couple of ventures have really been leading into the kind of magic tech. Mm. That, like, magic is just a substitute for tech in terms of stories. So, like, the uh, Keys of the Golden Vaults, people were complaining that's very much like heist. But they have, like, the heist text, like your little earbud mm. sending stones mm. and your mm. little, like, ho- magical holographic map mm. of the layout. And, like, that totally fits home alone. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you want to have the, no, it's just magic tech. That yes, that's what Home Alone is. It's got a certain level of tech. That's what we expect to encounter in Home Alone. Yeah, Ke- Kevin honestly works great as an artificer. Yeah, absolutely. He's, just, yeah. he's building all of these little magical traps. So, Rachel, what about some of the things they could not possibly predict what we're going to say? Some of the challenges. It's so goofy, guys. Yeah, it's, it's so goofy. <laughs> like, once again, you could ramp up the horror and do it more people under the stairs. Or, if you're a better GM than I am, you could ramp up the pathos. Mm-hmm. But... As a rule, it's going to be really goofy, and that might be what you want. You might want to do a silly Christmas session, mm. in which case, have so much fun. Then it's, then it's a strength and a challenge. But if you are running, like, this very dark, intense, horrifying Ravenloft campaign, then this is going to be very jarring. You need to have, like, kind of the right balance with the slapstick if you mm-hmm. want it to have that Home Alone tone, because we were talking about, you know, you could make it more brutal, you could make it more nasty and sadistic, mm-hmm. but then it's just another dungeon. Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, kind of getting that, you know, again, if you do want to do it scarier or darker, then doing that but still having the unique Home Alone flavor is going to be tricky. There is the fact that our Dark Lord is a small child. Yeah, yeah. We talked about ways to get around that. You can make him an adult. You could make him just the worst kid in the world who was born bad. He's mm-hmm. Damien from The Omen. Mm-hmm. But you know, it, that is a challenge that yeah, you have to yeah, work yeah. around. Like, like either... Either he has to not be Kevin McAllister anymore, or you're beating up an eight-year-old. This, this, like, we would be remiss in our job if we were like, by the way, this might involve your players punching a child. <laughs> That's fine. That's yeah, just, fine. just like, sure, like mm-hmm. that might be fine for your group, but they might, they might be like, hey, bonus, we hate children. 
and society frowns on us punching <laughs> them. But we got it. We got to like foreground that. I am all over having to be a horrible man child. Mm. I am. I am here for Kevin is forty years old. That is. <laughs> that is what I'm here for. And then the last one that you know we touched on this a little bit. We were oh. talking in the in the agent down section that. In this scenario, you are Harry and Marv, yeah. not Kevin. And nobody wants to be Harry yeah. and Marv. If you want to in, be Kevin, no one is less cool than Harry and Marv. In my mind, this is the strongest, the, the biggest challenge. Yeah. Because this is the one that every iteration, every tonal iteration is going to face. Mm-hmm. And you know, we had mentioned the streaming one that we're going to link to in the show yes. notes, where, where you end up teaming up with Kevin and helping to build traps against invaders. And I think doing something like that is the yes, way to go. Yes. In some way you turn things around. Like maybe even like you're able to get the high ground and you turn Kevin's traps against him. We know that if you have the high ground, yes. then the battle is over. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, that ultimately we can't make that our default story because that was from that uh, Watsy Home Alone inspired stream mm-hmm. uh, that we're linking to. So we can't say, do this because it's not our idea. Mm-hmm. But that's what I do. Yeah. I wouldn't do our idea, actually. <laughs> I, would do, I would do our idea, but then... I'd really have one of those plot hooks if somebody, like, hires you, a sort of Harry hires you to go get a Marv, but Marv, it's actually a lie, it's a trick, that's a good twist around as you see Harry and Marv together, and they were just sending you to kind of make a path, and then you get to, you know, PCs hate being tricked, so Mm -hmm. you then get to the PCs, get to be the Kevin, and then we want to be the Kevin. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe we talked about there's, like, the delivery guy who hires you to a tournament, like, maybe he's, uh, maybe he's tricking you. But yeah, we cannot we cannot present that as if it were our own idea, mm-hmm. but it is the best idea. You should do it. So, hopefully we have given you a wide range of possibility from brutally sadistic horror to lighthearted, goofy slapstick, perfectly great for children that love Home Alone. And, and, and so I put in F on a share of a cup of egg milk. Yes, like Ivan toasting taste. the great house of Delisnia. Um, <laughs> and as all should. As all should. <laughs> And before we rejoin our narrator and fi- find out where I promise less goofy place she's going to go to I'm next. I'm so excited. How can they contact us and tell us which iteration of Home Alone they decided to run? Well, before you contact us and tell us what iteration of Home Alone we decided to run, we actually scratch. have Sound effect. somewhere else that we're going before bum, our next bum, bum. Because we mentioned this in our Alameda Slim episode. Uh Uh-huh, which I'm sure you all listened to. (laughs) You should, actually. It's really funny. Terrible movie, great villain, fun episode. But this month, as a Christmas gift to you, we are going to be dropping our second episode of Book Club of Dread. Tower of Doom. Tower of Doom. So, we're hoping to get this dropped in like a week, the same as we did for Raven Nebula. But, with this episode, dear listeners, (laughs) you know how... Our two longest episodes to date have been our previous book club of dread and the first episode where we co-hosted with Chris Newton Mm -hmm, for Hunchback of Notre Dame. What if we did a (laughs) book club of dread inspired by Hunchback of Notre Dame where we co-hosted with Chris Newton? How long would that episode find (laughs) out in about a week? So Very long. We're hoping to get this dropped in about a week. I might still be editing. Yeah, right. really, we'll long. See. <laughs> really long. We are at, at this point, dear listeners. We have we have finished two recording sessions and we are not done yet. Also, a note with this episode: you are not going to be able to find this episode on your podcatcher of choice. We are going to be putting this on our Patreon. It will be a public post. This is our last public book club of Dread. After this, mm-hmm. it's going to be patrons only. But it's going to be a public post on our Patreon. And the reason for that... <laughs> it's not for Patreon money. No, it's not for Patreon money. It is entirely for branding. Because Tower of Doom... Boy, howdy. Um, it's, it's an extremely aging up novel. It's an extremely... Oh, <laughs> There was a lot of points where our Quasimodo analog, where his eyes flutter sensuously and he uh-huh. shudders in dark pleasure. Yeah, uh, there's, you're yeah, up a it's good, it's, a, it's a, a, an these extremely are, these are aging up yeah. novel. So, um, if we were to put this on our regular feed and it were to show up in your podcatcher of choice, we would have to mark it with little e for explicit, like uh-huh. even bleeping all the swear words out just because oh, yeah, it's no. disgusting. Yeah. And we don't want a case where, like, someone comes and this is the first episode they listen to and they think that that's what the show is. Yeah, either, either like, good or bad, you know? Yeah. Maybe, like, um, this is great. I can't wait for more of these, like, racy Raunchy. Bo- ra- yeah. Raunchy, <laughs> bad fantasy novel from the 90s. 
<laughs> Hit us on Patreon if you want us to make a spin-off podcast about raunchy bad fantasy novels from the 90s. We'll do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we are going it's going to be a public post. It's not just for patrons. Whether you're a patron yeah, yeah. or not, you can go listen to it. And we will when we drop it, we're going to drop a little just like two minute alert on our regular feed that'll show up on your podcast or with choice. the link to the Patreon. Yeah, with the link to the Patreon saying, hey, we dropped it. So you don't have to be like checking our Patreon yeah, constantly. Yeah. But just so you know, it's it's not going to be on Spotify. You gave us us one on Apple Podcasts, yeah, which is yeah. apparently how the majority of you like to listen to our podcast. <laughs> but like Steve Steve Jobs would shake his head from the grave, like in, in disappointment if we put this on his, <laughs> his precious Apple Podcasts. On a related note... On the theme of regret. On the theme of regret, yes. Our themed cocktail slash mocktail, please mocktail, please, yeah, please mm, mocktail, uh -huh. is the Christmas Bell Ringer. Uh-huh. It's very good. It's delicious. Or it was. Yes. A couple of weeks ago. Yes. Um, I am not going to be linking to a specific recipe in the show notes because we had to do a dramatic variation of it in this order like to have This is original. This is a homebrew. Yeah. Because literally, as written, yes, as written, it's almost entirely gin. But we we went with the Christmas bell ringer because there are multiple bell ringer cocktails, and clearly you have to do a bell ringer cocktail for, if you're going to be doing punch back. Yeah, that's actually one of the things that inspired us to try and make this our December bonus episode. Mm -hmm. But a lot of bell ringers have multiple different liquors that are interacting with each other in strange ways. It's going to be really hard to mocktail. The Christmas bell ringer is just gin and orange juice, and you can substitute gin with ginger beer, and have yourself a mocktail. Mm -hmm. So if you were doing the mocktail version, you're going to want to do one or two parts of ginger beer to one part orange juice. Mm -hmm. Experiment with it, see what you like yeah. best. If you're doing the cocktail version, mm -hmm. we did one part gin to one part ginger beer to one part orange juice, and I am begging you from the bottom of my heart, make it in small batches. Yeah. Go slow. Go slowly. Do not use an extremely strong ginger beer that will completely cover the taste mm -hmm. of your gin and make you not realize how much you're drinking. Mm -hmm. Because if you make yourself a very large Christmas bell ringer that you intend to nurse slowly over the course of a four-hour podcast recording session, your bell's going to get wrong, Ring my friend. Real, real <laughs> Good. That happens to me. So, ding dong. Ding dong. They're delicious. Yeah, no, they're good. We will never be able to drink them again. You're probably not. <laughs> so... Not till next Christmas at the earliest. <laughs> good heavens. So, if you're going to do this, then learn from our mistakes <laughs> and either just do the mocktail or make a very small batch. Yeah, go really slow. Drink it like, yeah, like a shot at a time. <laughs> so, if you decide to listen to us and follow our advice... Then you can tell us on various social medias if you decide to ignore us and drink a giant plastic tumbler in a cup <laughs> over the course of about two hours. It's you could also tell hours. us on social medias. Where would they tell us? Well, if you are capable of forming coherent yeah, sentences. you wouldn't be if the second thing. Yep. You can email us at wonderfulworldofdarklords at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook or Tumblr at Wonderful World of Dark Lords. You can find us on Patreon at Wonderful World of Dark Lords 651. Do not ask me why. I have no idea. And if you like our adaptation of the admittedly extremely difficult project of making a Ravenloft setting out of hmm. Home Alone. You like the way we adapt things into horror. We, we displayed a pretty broad knowledge of <laughs> trap-based horror fiction. Then I have a couple of other horror movies adapted into adventures. Uh, if you just go to more about this author on DMs Guild, follow the link in the show notes to the domain write-up, or if you just search for Tom Kohler. And if you like our consideration for kids and what would be fun for them, we also have a couple of resources for running spookier stuff like Castle Ravenloft or running horror games for kids. And then I, speaking of spooky things for kids, uh, I have a picture book, Mother Ghost, Nursery Rhymes for Little Monsters. It's exactly what it sounds like. And then if you prefer stuff for adults, you can go to my website, www.rachelkohler.com, which has a whole bunch of short stories I've written, some of which are available for free. Until next time, happy holidays. Thank you for listening, and happy gaming. Parting thoughts. The McElminster House is the greatest waste of time I have yet experienced on this journey. The manor tempts those who see it with visions of their desires, but offers nothing except pain and humiliation. 
Kevin himself is a spoiled brat that could put Peter Pan to shame. And given whatever he did to his own family, I wish him every ounce of the terror and misery that lurked behind his mischievous smile. I have enclosed the stolen journal for my patron's edification. My previous frustrations may have been a touch dramatic. Nonetheless, it vexes me that I cannot know which of my efforts are necessary and which are not until after the fact. If my patron wanted so badly for me to attain an interview with a vainglorious fraud like Ernesto de la Cruz, what else might he want that I do not know to deliver? I know that you value your privacy and keep your secrets close, Yensid, but as I entered the mist with my panther tooth mist talisman, I found myself wishing once again that you would put this subterfuge aside and trust in me. Regards, D. A sleek black carriage drawn by two dark horses emerges from the misty border, blocking Dee's way forward. Seated upon the coach box is a tall, gruff fellow with the appearance of one who will be more comfortable in leathers and furs and a dagger in each hand than the professional suit and tailored traveling cloak he wears. By their side is a young woman with a long mane of dark hair who appears more at ease wearing a similar uniform if it weren't for the unfading, feral grin she wore. We're here to escort you to Salem. The gruff fellow explains as the carriage door opens without any assistance. Upon the carriage seat is a small package with a folded up piece of parchment lying upon it, labeled with an elegant D. The parchment reads, Should you wish to alleviate yourself of the high fashions of Aslan before joining your family, why? And contained within the package is a swirling potion of purple and blue liquid. Your continued diligence is appreciated. Although trust does not come easily in these lands, I must ensure my desires remain unspoken. I have many enemies that would find no small amount of pleasure from ensuring I never have what I seek in my grasp. Your ignorance, though at times exasperating, ensures your safety. Be assured that none of your efforts have been in vain, my dear servant. Even when a particular domain holds little in regard to my personal interests, it may prove beneficial from an academic standpoint. Indeed, as ludicrous as it may seem, one can acquire valuable information even from one such as Kevin McElminster. Upon freeing himself from familial obligations, Kevin has become nothing more than a pampered child ruled by the shadows of his own paranoia. And without his family to guide him, he shall remain in this state forever. His very existence is a lesson for all who seek to sever themselves from their elders. For those who believe their own morals and convictions to be justified when in defiance of their own kin. I need not inform my scholar that such flippant disregard and abuse of magical tools to create such childish traps and illusions is abominable. A blatant insult to those who practice the art with the care and diligence it requires and deserves. If the McElminster house ever makes the mistake of arriving in my lands, I will ensure the little brat receives the welcome he deserves. This has been The Wonderful World of Dark Lords. We have no affiliation with Disney or Wizards of the Coast. All music recordings used in this episode are in the public domain and were obtained through MuseOpen.org. Titles and links are in the show notes. Dialogue for Yensid was written by Azalyn Rex himself, who you can follow on Tumblr at Dark Lord Azalyn. The Wonderful World of Dark Lord's logo was designed by Haylight Jones. You can find links to their work in the show notes. If you'd like to support the show, look for us on Patreon.com or find our tip jar on Red Circle. Thanks for listening! Hello, 
Hello, dear listeners. This is normally where we would have an outtake, but in this case, well, we did make mistakes in the recording. None of them were particularly funny. So instead of having an outtake from the Home Alone episode, we thought this would be a good place to have a sneak preview for Book Club of Dread, Power of Doom, which I don't think it's going to be ready a week after this episode drops, but hopefully before the new year. Fingers crossed. It's long. Enjoy. He hooked up the bell to the bell tower, and he rings it, and it makes the most beautiful sound he's ever heard. And he reaches to ring it again, but then a patch of shadowy air starts to swirl in the belfry, and three dark figures The car coils from Hunchback of Notre Dame. And they say they're the spirits of the bell, and he summoned them by tolling the Bell of Doom! The Bell of Doom. The Bell yes. of Doom. But this isn't the Tower of Doom. No! It's a different tower. I'm why really I lost. Wart asks why they're there, and they say, to kill. Kill! Kill! <laughs> I was hoping. Every time he said kill, I was like, God, I hope she does this kill again. <laughs> the curse of the Bell of Doom is that Every time the bell is rung, someone must die. The spirit's blood was shed to bind the metals of the bell together, and the curse is the price of their blood. (laughs) Wart asks who they're going to kill, and they say it's him! Whoa, no! That's a short novel. Wait, wait, did he, wait, did he literally ask for whom the bell tolls? 